sou o professor Dimitrios Kronopoulos, né? So, I'll, eu vou mudar para português, so I'll switch to English now. So, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce professor, uh, Dr. Dimitrios Kronopoulos uh, from the University of uh, Nottingham. Dimitrios is currently part of the Composites Research Group. Uh, he has a large, ex very large experience, I would say, in structural dynamics, damage diagnosis and prognosis, wave propagations, wave propagation, uh, aerospace structures and metamaterials in general. Uh, prior to joining the University of Nottingham, Dimitrios conducted research in structural dynamics and vibroacoustics within AADS Astrium, which is currently Airbus Defense in Space. He also holds a PhD from the Ecole Centrale de Lyon, an MSc in Automotive Systems Engineering in Loughborough University, and also a Master's uh, in Mechanical Engineering from the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, Dimitrios, you please can start your presentation directly from Athens nowadays. Great. So thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. So yes, I currently work for the University of Nottingham. However, I, I probably need to add that in about in about a month from now, you can find me at K11 in in, in Belgium. So, uh, well, I, I guess that my page and email will not be the same. So, just in case you'd like to contact me in a few weeks from now, just search for K11 instead of uh, Nottingham. So. Um, Adriano kindly suggested that uh, I have worked in a couple of different fields over the last uh, few years, and I have worked along with the team of Adriano as well. So part of the work is related to, uh, to what we've done together. So I'm going to be talking about waves and finite elements. So first of all, what can you do with waves? And secondly, why do we need waves um, in, uh, in wave calculations, in, in structural calculations. Well, uh, obviously you can do different things. First of all, you can do telecommunications with uh, with wave propagation. You can do energy harvesting. You can, if you go on to optics, you can do a number of different things that are beneficial for humans. And when it comes to actual structural applications, waves are very useful for calculating the structural response. Um, sometimes they're much faster than calculating in a, in a model domain. And also when it comes to vibroacoustics, so typically high frequencies, then waves are, again, very helpful because they accelerate uh, oftentimes the calculation of these, well, standard or non-standard problems. Um, well, this slide comes directly from my PhD, actually, so it's a bit old, but still valid. Okay, so if you want to send out uh, a certain mass up into space, you have to pay the price for it. Uh, at that point, about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was um, at the order of $35,000 uh, per kilogram. However, now with Elon Musk, this has changed a bit, so it's down to $15,000 uh, a kilogram. Still very expensive. So. Uh, doing the right calculations and optimizing your vehicle is very, very important. Uh, so with regard to acoustics, you have certain kind of excitations on a launch vehicle. Okay, so you have aerodynamic loads, so turbulent boundary layers or jet noises or diffused noises. Uh, so these actually challenge the survivability of a certain satellite or any kind of payload you would like to send up to space. So uh, engineers are putting extra mass just to help the satellites or different kinds of payloads to reach space without getting hurt, actually. Um, so obviously we need to work with this kind of complex systems. We need to understand their behavior and at the end of the day, optimize what they're doing. Uh, so that's, that's another reason for using uh, wave calculations. Uh, a, a further reason to use wave calculations is non-destructive evaluation or structural health monitoring. Uh, these two terms have uh, small differences, important but small differences. Uh, in any case, what you can do with waves is you can excite these into a certain structural part. Uh, it can be 2D, like the plate you see here. It can be complex uh, in terms of layering, so it can be a composite plate. Uh, or it can be 3D as well. Uh, it can be a bulk kind of body. Um, so the advantage you're having with uh, waves, or if you talk about lamp waves, for example, in this kind of two-dimensional body, uh, is low attenuation over long distances. So with a certain uh, small amount of energy, you can propagate that wave in long distances. And then by reflections, you can capture um, any 
inhomogeneities, any damage, anything you have in the structure. Uh, you have detectable strain pulses, so <clears throat> what you're getting back is actually measurable. Uh, and they're propagating, again, in very, very large distances within thin plates. Uh, sometimes they can be highly dispersive, which is good and bad. So the, well, the good aspect is that uh, you can distinguish different waves uh, from each other. The bad aspect is that sometimes uh, they can overlap, which means that uh, because of different speeds, um, which means that you're not really sure about what you're measuring at the end of the day. Um, and if we talk about biological media and not destructive evaluation, um, you could imagine that these may be uh, electromagnetic pulses that you're sending in in order to get this kind of detailed representation of all the nerves and uh, all the biological structure. But actually what's happening here is that you're sending uh, acoustic signals and the acoustic signals are generating uh, electromagnetic signals. So you have the photoacoustic, as they call it, uh, kind of um, non-destructive evaluation within human uh, tissue. Okay, so acoustics are actually a very important uh, medium of getting information about biological structures as well. Last but not least, you can control structures. Okay, so you can have active structures uh, going further into, um, well, robotics or um, active uh, and adaptive structures in general. And uh, we have done some wave calculations uh, in this context as well. So you can optimize the behavior in certain narrow band or broadband frequencies in these kind of, uh, let's say, absorption coefficients or whatever it is. So um, I'm going to be talking about why should we employ fine element techniques within these kind of complex media? Uh, what do we do generally in, in, in my team? Uh, and uh, beyond that, in order to model these kind of waves, and a couple of formulations that we have uh, done along with colleagues in the field. So why employ finite element techniques? Well, first of all, because we sometimes need to deal with complex structures, okay, like aircrafts or um, cars or ships, whatever it is. I mean, it can be uh, layered, it can be uh, periodic or non-periodic can be quite complex, so usually you do need finite elements in order to capture the complexity in these kind of structures. Um, you also need to employ composites in several applications because you want to go lighter, okay, and obviously you want to go more efficient. Uh, now the problem with layered structures like composites is that you need to capture these discontinuity and stresses that you're having between the different layers, okay, and then you're having the classical plate theory uh, that is not going to go very far in, in, in terms of frequency. Actually, what, what I have on this slide is a comparison between the, these different, um, different approaches. So you can have the uh, zigzag response, which you can see in these um, purple dots, and this is the, correct, the most correct response you can get. Um, this is also what you're getting with a wave fine element approach that we're using, and I'm going to be talking about that a bit later. But you can see that if you start at low frequency, and if you're only interested in this very low frequency range, then uh, any uh, approximation approach that you're going to be using is going to be working fine. However, uh, if you go higher and higher, then you can see that the divergence is going to be larger and larger, okay? So if you want to work in this high frequency regime, then you should not use the classical play theory, for example, because you will have a large divergence. Okay, so that's also partially why we need um, finite elements or zigzag techniques or general techniques that can capture these kind of discontinuity in the layer structure. Um, another reason to use finite elements is that uh, we need sometimes, again, to capture the full complexity of a certain structure. Um, so this um, topological modeling has been done with TechGen. TechGen is, uh, is a dedicated topological software developed in the University of Nottingham. So uh, we have been using that quite a lot in order to capture the mesoscale, as we call it. So in order to translate these micro CT scan, okay, from the real structure. This is it's an X-ray actually taken from the real structure all the way down to something idealized. Of course, uh, people in dynamic especially would say, why do I need this kind of detail? Well, you don't really need it, but if you want to optimize it for a static performance, for example, and if you want to optimize this kind of weaving in the structure, then 
uh, you actually need to work with this mesoscale uh, architecture because you want to optimize that architecture. So that's another reason to use finite elements to capture all that detail at the mesoscale. Um, well, some people are working on the micro scale as well. I've never done that myself, but um, some people can suggest that uh, you can even go deeper inside in terms of detail. Uh, something else we are doing with finite elements is implementing complex uh, damage models. Okay, so we talked about um, damage detection. If you want to go into damage identification, so try to get a bit more details about the damage you're having in the structure, the damage you detect, uh, then things are a bit more complex. You need to try different damage models inside your structure, okay? And then you're getting the signature of each of these damage model, finite element-based damage model, according to different excitations like static, dynamic, or ultrasound excitations. And then obviously you need all the identification mathematics uh, at the background in order to um, correspond to what you actually measure on the real structure with what you have modeled, the signature you have modeled in the numerical world, in the simulation world. Okay, so in order to go down to a certain amount of detail with regard to your damage model, especially in the composite structure, you need these finite elements. Okay, so that's the motivation behind using finite elements. Okay, I talked about waves, I talked about finite elements. How do these combine actually? What do we do in order to get the wave response in a certain structure? Uh, usually we're working with um, periodic structures and I say usually because with Adriano we have started a new chapter uh, about a year ago or maybe a bit more than that, uh, trying to model non-periodic structures actually. Um, and uh, when we deal with periodic structures, what we do is that we extract a periodic segment, so a parallelepiped, or uh, a periodic frustrum if we're talking about something curved, like a cylinder, or a single curved or a double curved structure, okay? So you're extracting these periodic segments, okay? And you're extracting directly from a finite element software the dynamic stiffness matrix for that structural segment. And then by post-processing these um, dynamic stiffness matrix, you can directly extract all the wave numbers, okay, equivalent to the wave speeds propagating in a certain structure, in that layered complex structure. And also the um, wave eigenvectors representing what kind of deformations this structure is having due to that propagating wave. So you effectively extract all the intrinsic dynamic properties of that complex structure. Because every kind of motion, every kind of dynamic motion is going to be a superposition of these eigenvectors, these different wave types propagating in the structure. Okay, so we can be talking about bending waves, okay, anti-symmetric or symmetric bending waves, whatever it is. Uh, it can be uh, analyzed through the corresponding wave numbers, okay, and every structural motion, as we said, can be decomposed to these different wave numbers and wave, mo uh, wave types. And you can capture the fundamental wave modes, but also the higher order wave modes uh, with this wave and finite element technique. Uh, so there are different ways of casting this problem. Okay, you could be talking about um, you could be talking about a transfer matrix approach, or you could be talking about a wave and finite element approach. Uh, effectively, the the assumptions are exactly the same, but I'm going to be talking very briefly about the different formulations of these uh, coupled fused wave and finite element approaches. Um, these are the original figures going back to 1973, actually. It was Dennis Mead at that point, starting this research in Southampton, okay, about, well, more than 40 years ago. So the main assumption here is that the displacements of the forces at the two sides of this uh, periodic segment are related with a certain difference uh, implemented as a phase constant. Okay, so the mu you can see here is the uh, phase difference of the vibration of the wave motion uh, between the elements rho and rho plus one. Okay, this is the fundamental assumption. And it's nothing different than a block wave. Okay, I mean, this phase difference exists all um, all the time within the Floki application, the Floki theorem application, the block wave application. So what Dennis Meads actually did is that he took these assumptions and applied them into one-dimensional structures and later into two-dimensional structures. Um, so by using these assumptions, you actually condense the dynamic stiffness matrix here by assuming you have no 
uh, internal loads, internal forces, okay, you're ending up with this eigenvalue problem. And by solving it, you, you get exactly the same information as I showed before. Uh, somebody else from the University of Southampton, so Robin Langley, extended that, um, that approach into two-dimensional um, two dimensional structures, about 20 years later, actually. So it took some time. Um, and now you can be talking about obviously waves traveling in any arbitrary direction from X all the way up to Y. Okay, so you can predict for, again, for very complex structures, as before, you can predict all the wave types propagating in different directions and uh, all the wave speeds associated uh, with these kind of wave types. Um, the second way of forming a very similar problem, the same approach actually, is what we call today the wave and finite element method, okay? And that was developed uh, by Brian Mace, um, well, a few years ago, about so 15 years ago. And uh, once again, we are starting with a dynamic stiffness matrix, incorporating all the intrinsic characteristics of the motion for a certain structure. Once again, we have to assume that there is no forcing applied um, inside the structure. And by condensing our problem, we can end up with a reduced approach. Uh, and by forming a transfer matrix, we can actually calculate all the lambdas, the lambdas being the eigenvalues, again, corresponding to the wave speeds and the, um, the wave types propagating the certain structure. And that's the actual eigenvalue problem that the team of Brian Mace has been solving. Okay, uh, and then a few years later, uh, same person, same academic, Brian Mace extended that approach into two-dimensional problems. Okay, uh, here you, once again, you uh, assume uh, phase differences in the X and in the Y direction, and by combining these phase differences inside the dynamic stiffness matrix of um, a certain segment, then you are ending up with uh, a formulation uh, by assuming one of the two wave numbers, you, you're ending up with a formulation that allows you to get the second wave number. So if you have the frequency and the wave numbers in the two directions, you have all the information you need to calculate all the different wave types, okay, uh, in the X and Y directions. Okay, so um, how do this compare? How does the, let's say, full periodic approach compares with the wave and finite element method? So uh, what you're actually doing in the full periodic approach is that you're getting these periodic segments of, let's say, complex beam, and you're modeling all the degrees of freedom, while for the wave finite element approach, you actually condense these internal degrees of freedom, and then you're calculating the corresponding wave numbers and uh, wave mode shapes. Well, they're actually comparing quite well because, as you can see here, you're getting these results on the left-hand side with the full periodic modeling and these results on the right-hand side with the wave front element um, approach. So you're losing almost no accuracy by using this condensed wave and front element uh, modeling. Um, if you do have if you don't care too much about the computational effort, then you you should feel free to use the full periodic method, um, even though it costs a bit more time-wise. Um, I guess for small models, it's going to work just fine. But if you go if you go higher into larger structures or more complex structures and larger models in general, uh, then these results are going to be detrimental if you want to model all the degrees of freedom, the internal degrees of freedom. This this time is going to be detrimental for your optimization uh, calculations. Well, in any case, you don't use much, you don't lose much accuracy with the wave and element approximation. So how do these two approaches compare? Uh, well, I mean, uh, as we, we uh, suggested, the accuracy is very much comparable. Uh, the computational cost is going to be higher for the full uh, finite element modeling within the um, periodic approach. Um, while for the inclusion of damping properties, only structural damping can be taken into account for the full periodic um, simulations, while any kind of arbitrary damping can be taken into account for the wave and finite element calculations. Uh, I'm happy to share the presentation and maybe we can discuss a bit more into these different, um, well, different architectures in terms of the modeling of the periodic segment in case you have any comments. Good. Um, we have been using quite extensively the uh, hybrid wave finite element, Schloss finite element approach 
especially when it comes to damage identification. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, this is happening. This is the approach you should be using if you want to couple a certain waveguide. And remember, the waveguide is always something ideal, something perfect, okay, with no kind of inhomogeneities um, implemented. I mean, it can have periodic inhomogeneities, but nothing really um, localized, okay. Um, while if you want to couple that kind of waveguide or multiple waveguides with a certain coupling element which contains uh, some kind of damage or some kind of difference, okay, let's say it could be a stiffener, okay, so it could be a structural element that is different than the periodic waveguides. So in that case, you probably need to couple your finite element model with the motion of these waveguides. So mathematically, what needs to be done is that you need to couple the uh, waveguides described into the wave domain, the motion of which is described in the wave domain, um, with the motion of the coupling element which is described in the physical domain, so X, Y, Z. Okay. Um, sorry, physical domain meaning that it's uh, given by the uh, displacements directly implemented in the finite element software, while these are given again in X, Y, Z, but in wave modes. Okay, so in that case, what you're doing is that you need to model the uh, intermediate coupling elements. Okay, you need to get the dynamic stiffness matrix of that coupling element. And you need to couple that with the wave mode shapes that are coming from the substructure one and substructure two. So the two wave guys on these two sides. Okay, um, if you do that, well, I have included all the references. So I'm also happy to show the presentation. So you can directly click on the references and uh, find all the related information. Uh, so if you couple these wave mode shapes with the structural displacement, the physical structural displacements over that coupling element, then in that case you can get all reflections, okay, and all transmissions. And these reflections and transmissions are providing the signature of any kind of inhomogeneity that you have in this coupling element. Okay, as I said, it could be damage, it could be something different. Uh, but these reflection transmissions are something unique, okay, representing anything inside of that coupling element. And obviously, we're using this information, we're using the signatures to identify what is inside that coupling element. Uh, 2D wave interactions, well, uh, again, things are quite similar. What you're doing here is that you're using the um, dynamic stiffness matrix of the two-dimensional elements, okay? And you have the transformation matrices, including all the phase differences um, in the y direction. You're guessing the x, uh, what's happening in the x direction, and you're trying to find out what's happening in the y direction. Okay, uh, so you're having the plus uh, wave mode shapes going towards the intersection. Okay, and you have the minus wave mode shapes going away from the intersection. Um, so what you're having is something incoming. Okay from one of the two sides, can be the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And then, of course, you have something outgoing, so something transmitted, okay? Just imagine two plates, for example, you have some kind of intersection and then um, the wave partially is transmitted and partially is, is reflected back to plate one. Okay, so uh, what you can do is calculate these transmission and reflection coefficients, okay? Uh, this A plus and A minus, uh, the amplitudes of this, um, well, um, transmitted and reflected. At the end of the day, you're getting a scattering matrix, which is, again, the signature of what's happening in between these two plates. Um, we have already including damage, okay, in, these, um, in this portion here. The problem we're facing is that you can obviously get the scattering coefficients, but the damage needs to be periodic under what we're doing now. One of the problems we're having is that, um, well, we have several approaches, but we don't know which way to take, which is the optimal way to take. For example, if you have a localized portion of damage somewhere here. Okay, remember that we're talking about periodic models in two directions. So uh, if damage is periodic, once again, on the boundary, then that's perfectly fine. Everything is captured very well by this model. If the damage is not periodic, then uh, we, we're trying to find out what's the best approach to use if you have something very, very localized. So if you do have any uh, opinion about that, so any, any ideas, please do let us know. So uh, wave interaction with nonlinearities. Uh, this is something we have briefly worked on. We try to model the uh, nonlinear 
uh, interaction of ultrasound with a certain kind of kissing, kissing croc, okay, a croc that has some kind of large displacements inside it. Um, because we do feel, we do think that these nonlinear signatures, these uh, harmonics, higher order harmonics, are going to be very important for uh, for understanding the kind of damage and the size of damage we have inside the structure. Uh, before I go into the modeling side, I can tell you that the nightmare of all um, ultrasound modelers, especially when it comes to nonlinearity, is the uncertainty and the impacts of uncertainty on the measured results. So we have done a couple of experiments and uh, we have also colleagues uh, in Scotland that have done several experiments on this topic. And the problem everybody's having is that, well, first of all, you have so much nonlinearity coming from sources other than damage. So you have nonlinearity coming from water, for example. So if you measure something underwater, then you can have a lot of harmonics, but nothing to do with, with damage, uh, the, the presence of damage in there. And the second problem we're having is that the same samples, we manufacture exactly the same samples, we are implementing exactly the same cracks or something that is nominally the same in all three or four or five samples. And these three, four, five samples give exact, give very different responses. So you can imagine that these harmonics go one, two, three in one structure, and then they, they can be, be in an ascend order or a descending order for a different structure. So we feel that uncertainty has a very important role when it comes to uh, measuring the non-linear harmonic response of such structures. Okay, so uh, I'm sharing uh, my my nightmares with you. Okay, just in case you do have any experience and you do have any suggestions on that. Uh, and then I'm going going on to what we have done in terms of modeling nonlinear response in, in certain kind of structures. So the idea is exactly the same as classical ultrasound. What's happening is that you have some kind of excitation, okay, in a certain ultrasound frequency. And then you have reflections coming from a certain uh, from a certain coupling element containing damage, okay, back to the excitation, or you have portion of these waves transmitted on the other side. Um, now, if you have a large amplitude, or if you have something that is uh, having any kind of contact, as I said, like a kissing uh, crack, then you will have a development of some harmonics inside your structure. So in the general model, what we have uh, done here, what we have assumed is that you're having an incoming wave, omega plus, as you can see here, you're having a coupling element. Again, this coupling element is typically containing the damage inside it. And then you're having multiple waveguides, okay? Uh, the wave obviously is transmitted into these two waveguides as omega, two omega, and three omega. So you have all the higher order harmonics and then partially reflected as well back as again, omega, two omega, and three omega. So you're trying to capture the amplitudes of the higher order harmonics inside this kind of structure. This is your periodic element. So you're getting the dynamic stiffness matrix um, of that periodic element. And from the dynamic stiffness matrix, by using either of the wavefind elements or the full uh, periodic modeling approaches that I showed earlier, you can get the wave mode shapes uh, like this. So you have all the files propagating in there. So you have to group them, okay? You have to get all the um, wave mode shapes pro uh, corresponding to the nominal frequency or wave mode sh shapes uh, corresponding to higher order waves, okay? So two omega, three omega, etc., etc., And then you're combining uh, all of these into a, a, a dynamic stiffness matrix that contains the displacements, okay, of that uh, coupling element and also the wave displacements, okay, of these different waveguides. So you have uh, Z, okay, which are the displacements of the coupling element is equal to R times uh, the displacement of the waveguides. Okay, R is simply uh, a transformation matrix according to different angles, okay, of these different waveguides. Okay, so you couple the entire problem together. Uh, and then you're using a harmonic balance approach, or at least that's what we did. Uh, we used the harmonic balance approach in order to not only take into account for the fundamental excitation frequency, but also the subharmonics, okay, 
so 1 over h, so half omega, 1 fourth omega, etc., etc., and also the hyperharmonics, okay, which are multiples of that frequency. So you can do it for the uh, displacements and also for the forces. And if you inject this kind of solution into your general formulation of the scattering matrix that we saw earlier, then you can get not only the transmission reflection coefficients for the fundamental frequency, but also the transmission reflection coefficients for higher order frequencies, so higher harmonics, like 3 omega, 2 omega, 4 omega, etc., etc. And this is what you can get out of um, a finite element simulation, for example, um, implementing a sort of non-linear coupling element right here. Okay, so you can see that we have some kind of agreement between the finite element approach and the wave finite element approach that I showed in the early in the previous slides. Okay, so by using these um, the signatures, these higher order signatures, the harmonic signatures, we should be able to identify that much in easier way. However, as I said, uh, the problem in physics is that you have different sources of uncertain different sources of non-linearity and secondly that the nominally identical structures are giving you different non-linear responses so that's also another problem that uh, needs to be solved if we can solve it in a certain way okay so numerical issues um first of all um you can have discretization errors okay so if you uh, do not have elements that are small enough for your wavelength. I mean, do remember that you need at least 10 to 20 elements. My recommendation is 20 elements per wavelength, okay, in order to be able to capture the corresponding propagating wave numbers um, with a good accuracy, okay. Obviously, if you want better accuracy, you need to go higher into the number of elements. Um, well, computational effort is directly related with the size of the model, okay? Uh, it's still much better, generally speaking, than modeling the full structure. Uh, so modeling a single periodic element of the structure still provides uh, a good advantage, uh, computationally speaking. Um, find element interpolation functions, okay? If you talk about a linear interpolation function, then obviously you have some kind of basic um, accuracy, but if you want to go higher, then obviously you need to implement higher order functions inside your finite elements. Uh, and then you also need enough significant digits because you remember that the stiffness, the dynamic stiffness matrix for a certain segment is K minus omega squared times M. And also remember that for a very, very small periodic segment, uh, you have a very, uh, you have very large entries into your stiffness matrix and also very, very small entries inside your mass matrix, okay? So if you combine this K minus omega squared times M, then uh, sometimes you can actually get numerical errors, as you can see here, as, at low frequencies, just because you don't have enough significant digits inside your mass matrix, okay? Um, so making sure that you have these significant digits in the low frequency range especially is very important. You can have pollution errors, obviously, as with any fine element model, and you can also have repeated eigenvalues, especially for symmetric structures. So in that case, you need to follow standard approaches to deal with these repeated eigenvalues uh, and sometimes eliminate some of them. So what about technological applications? Um, again, Brian Mace uh, has worked a bit with cylinders, okay, and uh, they have worked with uh, calculating the dynamic response of cylindrical structures very, very efficiently. So if you deal with, um, well, these kind of complex structures and imagining that this is a uh, perfect cylinder, then you can get this kind of frequency response function uh, within a few seconds, sometimes in less than a second. Uh, while you may imagine that if you want to calculate the dynamic response uh, of, of, of a a fuselage, uh, you should be spending hours, if not days, into calculating the uh, response function at high frequencies like, like the one you can see here. Um, obviously, we're not talking about perfect cylinders, okay, which means that the wave finite element responses are not going to be as accurate as full finite element modeling, complete finite element modeling. However, the, the vision here, the vision that many people are having, is to cut these different um, parts of the complex structure into 
more idealized port, let's say a certain cylinder with a beam here, okay, a quasi-periodic beam. And then calculating the intrinsic wave behavior for each of these different elements of the complex structure individually, then combining everything together in order to get the response for very large and very complex bodies at very low computational effort. And obviously this means that you can optimize that as well. I mean, if you want to optimize something that takes 10 hours to run, then probably you need years, okay? But if you want to optimize something that takes one minute to run, then you do have very good chances to do that. Um, so just a reminder about how important it is, once again, to work in the entire frequency range, okay? So remember that what you have typically in the dynamic response for a certain structure, a certain element, is the low frequency range where you have this very nicely distinguished model behavior, okay? Uh, and then you have the high frequency response on the uh, on the high frequency ends, okay? Uh, there is no real reason to try and get the peaks um, in, uh, in this region. Uh, well, first of all, because you have a large amount of uncertainty. So the, any, any small uncertainty you will have at the, at the material level, at the coupon level, uh, will manifest itself very efficiently in this high frequency range, which means that um, practically you cannot really approach the single peaks so the resonances, each of these resonances at the high frequency range by doing a full finite element simulation. Uh, and that's exactly why people generally talk about medians, okay, median response, uh, average response, whatever it is, okay, instead of talking about model responses in this kind of high frequency range. And obviously you also have the mid frequency range, which is still to be covered by a number of different approaches that are serving as a candidate. Uh, so the good thing about a very fast model, a very efficient model, is that it can cover obviously the model part, okay, but also the mid-frequency part as well. And then if you really want to go into high frequency, you can just average the response you're getting from these wavefront element approaches. So what we're looking for is spatial response in information, okay, which we're getting out of the wavefront element me methods. Um, and also we're looking for key calculation times in rational levels, especially for optimization purposes. And so this is also what we can have, we can get with uh, wavefront elements. Well, vibroacoustics is another um, topic, okay, in which the uh, different uh, approaches can be applied. So coupling structural wave motion to acoustic waves obviously takes more time for that to uh, for, for such models to run. However, um, if you do have an efficient uh, wave propagation calculation for the structural part, then you can directly couple these wave number information with the acoustic wave number information that you have for the acoustic cavity. So in that case, you can get um, different approaches to calculate the phenomenological behavior, vibroacoustic behavior of, of, of these subsystems. Um, some people talk about dynamical energy analysis, okay, statistical energy analysis like SCA, okay, wave-based method. So there's a supermarket of models developed back in uh, in the early 2000s, even earlier than that actually, trying to get this wave information into phenomenological indices like acoustic, lo uh, uh, acoustic transmission loss, for example, uh, for complex structures like the ones you can see here. And the basis of all these methods is the wave information that you're getting out of either wavefind elements or other approaches. Structural health monitoring is another large and very important field of application of these methods. So uh, we talked about very academic examples here. We talked about these one-dimensional waveguides coupled with one-dimensional uh, damage segments. But if you manage, if we manage in the next uh, 10 years to develop that for develop that approach for two-dimensional structures and calculate these signatures very efficiently, then you can localize damage, okay? You can quantify damage. So remember that it's not only important to see a red light in an aircraft, for example. Um, so you may have a very nice system, okay, that detects a very, very small amount of damage of, let's say, half a millimeter. Um, now, the problem is that if, if the pilot sees a red light, if you don't know what kind of damage that is, what type it is, and what size it has, uh, then you're almost obliged to land the aircraft and somebody will come and inspect, well, find out potentially that this is a very, very small amount of damage and the aircraft can still fly. 
And then obviously two hours later, you will still have a red light because uh, the system will still be able to detect some kind of damage. So it's not only important to detect damage, it's also very, very important to quantify damage. It's very, very important to make sure that you have a certain amount of guaranteed hours of flight remaining before your next service. Okay, uh, and you should also make uh, make sure you don't have any false alarms. Uh, so very, very small amounts of damage are always present in a certain structure. So you shouldn't stop your operation because of, of that. You should be able to detect, um, well, the, the minimum, probabilistically minimum size of damage under which you should, over which you should be uh, obliged to land a certain structure, stop the operation and do a full inspection. So quantifying, characterizing damage is very important. Uh, and also localizing damage is very important because somebody saves time when the system tells them uh, that the damage detected is in that location. So go directly, instead of inspecting the entire structure, go directly there and search for the damage. So all these kind of pieces of information are very important. Um, can we do it with ultrasounds? Yes, we can. The problem with ultrasound is that it, it, is that it gives typically very complex signatures. Okay, so if you talk about a complex structure like fuselage, um, you have multiple reflections, you have, a, you have a lot of stiffeners, you have a lot of connections in there. So you, as a result, you're getting a very, very complex signature back. Okay, nothing to do with what you can see here uh, in this graph. So in that case, you need to pay attention and make sure that you um, denoise your data, you have to treat your data, process them and only keep the patterns that you're interested in. Okay, uh, another challenge is damage modeling. I briefly talked about that. I don't do any damage modeling myself, but I'm trying to use the models coming from uh, different colleagues, okay? So um, you can talk about mesoscale damages. That's very nice and uh, very attractive, okay, attractive, but the problem is that you spend a lot of time implementing the different types of damage in these mesoscale models. Um, we tried that through a PhD student of mine about two years ago. Uh, however, as you probably imagine, in order to delete one of these threads, one of these weaves, uh, you, you, you're you spending a very large amount of time. And at the end of the day, um, being interested in just a weave being broken uh, is probably not what a maintenance engineer is going to be looking for. So still, we are looking for larger amounts of damage, and that's what we are turning our interest towards these days. So notches or delaminations or something that is really going to affect the survivability of a certain structure, of a composite structure. Uh, I briefly talked about the challenges here. So I briefly talked about uh, correspondence between experiments and simulations, uh, just because the uncertainty is very important, especially when it comes to nonlinear responses. Um, this is the um, this is the vision we're having for a structured health monitoring. Again, I talked briefly about that. So whenever you you're designing a certain structure. Ideally, you would like to get some damage recognition patterns on for this kind of structure. So let's say that you have a delamination within a certain core, okay, or you can have a crack, or you can have a, a notch, uh, you can have a crushed kind of part of that structure, okay. Could we get that structure into a supercomputer and get these damage recognition patterns, uh, obviously by either wave interaction responses, so shooting ultrasound into this kind of, um, of damage and getting the response back, or using other kind of fine element techniques, cheaper techniques, whatever it is. So can we get these damage recognition patterns, whatever they are, then upload them on the online device, which is operating um, on the aircraft. And then by collecting all the signatures, can we identify uh, what kind of size of damage we're seeing, what kind of type of damage we're seeing, and what kind of location of damage we are seeing online uh, while the aircraft is flying, while the car is working, while the ship is navigating, etc., etc. Okay, another problem is the great amounts of combinations. I just talked about four different damage types, and obviously if you combine them with different locations, different uh, sizes, okay, different types, that you're ending up probably with hundreds, if not thousands of scenario. Okay, so that's a bit of a nightmare again, if you want to distinguish between all of them. But then again, you can cluster them into different teams, okay? 
uh, or you can have some kind of Pareto front. Okay, so you can you you, you may be able to recognize um, if if the response is within a green or within a red area. So you can have groups of information, let's say damage characteristics that correspond to red areas. So you can model them as a group, not just like um, a single scenario. Optimized computational efficiency. This is very much related both with the HPC that you can see here. So how can we get very, very quick signatures? And partially the way fine element models we're developing are related to um, getting faster signatures. And obviously you also need very, very fast identification algorithms running online. So this is also something that we have been working on. Machine learning is something we have not touched yet, but I feel that uh, where the entire world is going, this is something we will not avoid. So, uh, you know, maybe in the next five or 10 years, uh, well, already machine learning has invaded the structural health monitoring field. So maybe we should be, we maybe will be able, we'll be, we'll be able and obliged partially to work with this kind of approaches. Okay, and minimize the output damage recognition patterns. I already talked about that. Um, design of multifunctional structures that goes back to the uh, cylinders and conical shape structures and beam structures, whatever it is, okay, that I talked about on a fuselage. So can we uh, substructure any kind of complex structure um, like the one you can see here? Can we substructure it into uh, various parts that can be individually modeled? And then by combining the signature, we can actually get uh, the mechanical behavior of the structure, the acoustic performance of that structure, uh, and also optimize the uh, inner architecture or the general architecture uh, for that kind of complex segment. So um, you should be able to optimize the, uh, let's say, weaving, the mechanical characteristics of the composite phase sheets here, and you should be able to also optimize the, um, the geometry, the architecture of that intermediate core right here. Um, working with a variety of geometries like uh, curved panels, flat panels, non-periodic panels, conical panels is a challenge. But then again, you have many people working on this topic. Okay, and as I said, you should be able to get the response of that structure under, under various loads. Um, this is very much related to what we saw before. So we have been working with the, optimizing the architecture of um, of a sandwich structure. So we're trying to optimize the core architecture in order to get um, minimum vibration response with minimum mass. So minimize the vibration response with a small amount of added mass. Uh, and also what we have done partially uh, following the work done by the team of uh, Mohamed Yishu in, in France, in Lyon, uh, what we have done is that we have implemented pierce electric patches in two-dimensional structures in order to absorb the um, vibration of a certain structure within very small um, ranges of frequencies. I don't know if I have any results. Yes, these are the results, actually. So um, you can see that you have maximum uh, absorption. Okay, you can actually have maximum reflection. So you have an insulation kind of thing um, between the two uh, parts of these waveguides. Okay, uh, so you have uh, minimum transmission and maximum absorption within a certain uh, natural frequency to which you're tuning your <clears throat> uh, piezoelectric elements here. And obviously by changing the characteristics of these piezoelectric elements, you can also change this natural frequency. Um, in which case you can adapt the uh, operation range, the operation frequency range for these kind of structures. Uh, now, obviously, one of the problems is that you have a very, very narrow band response right here when it comes to the isolation, the mechanical isolation of these structures. Uh, but if you play with your RL circuits, okay, uh, or if you add a capacitor and if you optimize this RLC circuit, uh, then in that case, you can end up with something much more broadband than what you can see here. So that's another field in which um, wave calculations are involved. Well, electromagnetic compatibility, this is not really something I've been working on, but I've included this slide um, just to complement the applications of different wave types. Um, again, if you have the fundamental 
electromagnetic wave modes that are propagating in a certain structure, like an aircraft, let's say, uh, you can use this information to find out, to quantify any um, EMC, electromagnetic compatibility effects or problems you could be having um, in a certain design. And nowadays you do get some fine element packages that actually do both. And that's, that's very attractive, actually. Um, you do get fine element software that can optimize different disciplines together, like the vibroacoustic discipline, okay, the static discipline, and the electromagnetic discipline. And this is really what, what we can see as future, especially for, um, especially for companies that do not have research departments uh, that are dedicated to these different disciplines. So nowadays, by buying this kind of software by yourself, you can get a certain product and you can optimize in all these different ways. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds, but this is what many people, academics and industrials are looking into. Okay, so a um, couple of uh, last slides. So my presentation is almost done. Um, Determination of the optimal element size for uh, the wavefront element calculations is one of the things we have been looking at, okay? Uh, Post-processing of the wave results, so which of the wave modes are actually propagating, which of the wave modes do not offer any, any added information to the energy flux in a certain structure. Um, how do we incorporate arbitrary dumping models? How do we get good accuracy at high frequencies? Um, how do we provide good results for uh, certain angles of propagation, okay? Um, and these are all uh, questions we have been asking ourselves. We have been doing work over the last 10 years on these aspects, uh, but there could be more work to be done. Uh, how do we reduce the computational effort? This is very important for optimization purposes, okay? Um, if you go out, you can see a supermarket of models um, especially fine element models like geometric fine element models or extended fine element models for crack modeling. Um, so coupling these techniques with what we already have is an aspect that we have been investigating. So concluding remarks, you can get some significant advantages for, especially for layer structure by using fine elements and by using wave propagation uh, modeling, you can also get the fundamentals of any kind of motion that can be existing can be propagating in the structure. So you can capture all the intrinsic properties that you need to describe the motion of that structure. Uh, so the wave propagation problem can be cast into various forms. We've seen some advantages and disadvantages. And if you have anything to add on it, please do shout. Um, so um, disadvantages and risks are similar to the nature of the fine element modeling, just because you're talking about large models, okay. Uh, the computational effort is related again to solving a fine element modeling, so a fine element model. So at the end of the day, you're talking about a problem of the same nature, even though you have post-processed it, post -processed it in a certain way. While uh, wave fine element techniques are finding their way into several technological applications, but still obviously we need to optimize computational effort in order to push them towards larger structures, more complex structures. And yeah, complexity is the key here. Complexity both in terms of geometry, but also complexity in terms of damage inclusions, inhomogeneity inclusions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So dealing with these complexities is a key in order to push further this kind of wave, uh, finite element calculations inside technological applications, inside the society. Because at the end of the day, everybody, all the engineers want to design the new products of this century with their own techniques. Okay, so to do that with these kind of techniques, you need to deal with complexity, exactly like full finite element is doing. So we need to do, we need to get the same results as full, full finite element, but much faster actually, much more efficiently. Okay, so uh, yeah. I mean, wave fine elements are not always a panacea, um, and that's very much related to dealing with complexity. So if you can run away with something that deals with complexities in a more efficient way, uh, so if you can model your structure with full fine elements and get your results within a rational amount of time, just do it, okay? You don't have to use wave and fine element calculations. Um, good, good. Okay, and that's it. Okay, uh, including QMI, uh, favorite motors actually. So 
Um, to, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <clears throat> and that's very much related to the fact that uh, way of elements is not a panacea, okay? So you don't have to use that tool just because you have this tool. You should always be using tools that are appropriate for a certain kind of application. So if you deal, for example, with a thin metallic structure, why don't you use analytical modeling, for example? Uh, that's what I tell to my students, okay, you have to make sure that what you're doing, what you're developing actually has some kind of importance and can be either faster or more accurate in a certain application. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, your attention. Hope you so, with me now. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dimitris, for the very interesting and broad presentation. It was, I mean, uh, I've seen a very large set of applications and questionings and uh, interesting points that you made. You actually, it was very nice that you actually share your some of your nightmares with nonlinearities and waves. Uh, we are starting to work with that in our group as well, and there are some people. Uh, I mean, we can talk about that at some point as well. But uh, then I'll, I'll start. I, I understand that you're very tight on the schedule. I guess. Uh, so yes, we have time. Actually, yeah, I haven't been watching <laughs> for a few minutes so, now. Okay. Perhaps uh, one or two questions. I don't know if you, if you want to make a question or perhaps or hit, raise your hands or open your mic directly. I don't know. So Alina, I suggest that uh, there is a question. Yes, Alina. Hello. Please. Oh, sorry. So That's thank fine. you for the presentation. Very nice talk. I thought that Leopoldo was going to talk, so I was waiting for him. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. So my point is concerning the nonlinearities, so the nonlinear system. So that you mentioned that you have different responses for the same system. So my question is, did you evaluate the global behavior of the system? So uh, did you have several uh, possibilities of responses or it was like two possibilities because it's usual for some kinds of non, some kinds of nonlinear systems that you have a coexistent stable solutions. So my question is: Is uh, in your case, is it possible to be only these coexistent solutions, or do you have several possibilities of responses that you can't explain? Well. So I, I guess there are several possibilities of this concept. Um, the thing is that the thing is that we got we got three beams, and then we used um, some water jet cutting in order to get something very very small as a crack, and mm -hmm. then we tried to propagate uh, the 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 ultrasound at two hundred kilohertz through that crack, uh, and we tried to push as much as possible in terms of um, in terms of amplitude of the responses. Um, to generate this nonlinearity, so the problems could be uh, could be the cracks could be different. Okay, mm -hmm. the other problem can be that the, the 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 glue of these patches is different, or the size of each glue is different in each of these beams. So the glue itself can generate some nonlinearity, um, and obviously, you know, you have different patches, different sensors. So okay. we have so much source of uncertainty. The thing is, the thing is that the fundamental frequency was stable. So passing on from from the first beam to the second beam to the third beam, then we had a very very similar signature with regard to the fundamental frequency. Awesome. But as you were going higher up into harmonics, then it was it was totally different. Ah, okay. okay. And one another question, actually, we are beginning to work with these, uh, and as Adriano mentioned, and the harmonic balance, you use the, uh, use the harmonic balance to solve the, 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 the nonlinear the non -linear system. And the, as, a, as far as I know, it is used to solve periodic solutions. Yeah. And do you, did you have the case of chaotic response? So if you have a chaotic response, does the method Say to you, well, it's not working. The error is too, is too high. So we, yeah, so uh, we we didn't get any chaotic response. I, I I need to go back to the results and 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 check that out actually because what we're doing effectively is that we're just FFTing the mm -hmm. response from finite elements, so we're getting some coefficients for each of different harmonics corresponding to the energies of, of that 
harmonic frequency. Um, so that's all we did, but we didn't check for any chaotic response actually. Okay, thank you, because just we're uh, talking here uh, when we can use this balance, uh, the, this, uh, the harmonic balance, because if it's harmonic, if it's a periodic solution, we can use, but if it's chaotic, no. So thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome, thank you. So do we have any, any more questions? If you can do it in Portuguese, I can translate. It's not an issue, actually. Can I ask a quick question? Please, Leopoldo. Uh, thanks thanks for nice the opportunity. Yeah, indeed. Thanks for inviting us for, for the talk, and thank Dimitris for the nice talk. Uh, actually, it's a bit related to what Alini has just asked. Uh, I was happy to see the slide where you show the piezo with the shunt circuit. Uh, what we, we want to do here is to combine that approach with the then the shunted piezo, but instead of having an uh, LC circuit or RLL circuit, we want to add a nonlinear circuit there. And, and then still having like a periodic system, but our unit cell model has some embedded nonlinearities. Mm -hmm. Do you have a view on that, or can you say some words regarding? Yeah, but uh, you so you you want an, a nonlinear design of the LCR circuit of the electronic circuit. Yeah, like indeed. The... In, in in order to explore, for example, uh, nonlinear energy sink uh, effect. Uh, well, that's quite interesting, it's... actually. So uh, yeah, maybe you can do a broadband uh, attenuation uh, through these nonlinearities. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I, you I... foresee it? means of like, for example, having uh, a, a way to reduce that model to to work with. A finite structure, for example, to consider boundary condition effects when you have such such nonlinearities and and several of those uh, unit cells with nonlinearities. There's, this is a good question. Can we implement the nonlinear electric circuit into the finite element model as it is now? I I, have, I I need to check the equations probably, but that's that's a very good question. Maybe there is no modification to be done. Maybe you you can directly include the characteristics of your LCR circuit inside the finite element calculations. Uh, but it's something you need to check. Thanks. Okay, so we have perhaps one more question or something very quick. Or, or alguém se se algum aluno quiser perguntar pode ser em português, não tem problema. Se tiver alguma dúvida, uh, just meanwhile, I just say that uh, Professor Aruda from uh, Unicup said excellent talks, Demetrius. Uh, he was sorry couldn't stay any longer. Uh, and congrats for the position in KU Leuven. Uh, look forward to collaborate with you on SHM using smart materials, better material layers. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Dimitrios is, uh, is invited, uh, take part, takes part in this invited research on this uh, in vivo project that they have with people from Campinas, University of Sao Paulo, and Milton Universities in Sao Paulo as well. So. Uh, we have also been collaborating with the group of Demetrius in terms of metamaterials and non-periodic structures, uh, rainbow types of metamaterials and other, uh, and other applications as well. Uh, so if we don't have any more questions, I perhaps would like to ask Demetrius to uh, one question. Uh, we, have been, we have been working on uncertainty modeling and break of periodicities in terms of wave propagations using this uh, FE, WFE uh, modeling. Can you comment a bit on that? Or how do you see this, this kind of technological problem, say from uncertainties from manufacturing, especially coming from 3D printers and other, and this kind of new technologies that are not so new, but which are being broadly used well, now? So, so design-wise, you mean? Yeah, design-wise. So, say uh, if you were a mechanical engineer or a practical engineering, uh, can you use that? How, how do you see that in terms of designs? Well, it is, it is a big thing, isn't it? Because the, um, the good thing about 3D printing is that you can get whatever you want. But if you talk about structural parts, then you need to make sure that you have a certain kind of quality for these parts. And um, it's, I mean, it's not really only us working on that. You, you can have large uh, community area working on uncertainty, especially in, in these complex structures. Um, and you know, it's it's not by luck that you don't see many structural applications for three D printed structures because people are, lack, are lacking the trust to to apply these things into you know life threatening, potentially life threatening kind of situations. Um, again, we need to push them one way or the other. Uh, our way is to 
uh, quantify the probability of failure or quantify the probability of having a low amount of, of performance. So for example, if you're printing something to reduce the noise and vibration, what is the probability of actually getting, let's say, minus 5 dB instead of minus 10 dB? Um, so socially speaking and engineering speaking, these are very important details and information that needs to be provided to the actual designers. Um, with regard to the actual modeling, uh, I feel that, you know, when it comes to non-continuous structures like lattice structures, uh, it's, it's a bit more challenging to apply wave calculations because the problem is that wave calculations give you some very nice information about um, propagating wave speeds or wave numbers. But when it comes to localized response, because to get from one node, node to, to the other node in a graph structure, you follow this, all these different paths. When it comes to high frequency response, then you're having a very, very complex kind of wave map. Um, and at the end of the day, my experience is that your calculation times may be comparable with, with full finite elements. So if somebody can come up with a smart model, like a graph model, okay, of responses of different nodes of this structure, uh, in, a, in a very efficient way, I think that this will unblock the uh, possibility for optimizing the structure, possibility of optimizing under uncertainty, which is very important, uh, and uh, also possibility about localizing potential damage in the structure, but we need fast models. For now, we have what we have is not enough for these kind of lattice structures. So yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge. Okay. So if you don't have any more questions, I'll close the today's seminars. Thank you again for Dr. Dimitris Kronopoulos. Uh, and thank you again for the questions. And so see you next time on the next seminar. And thank you.